Thank you, brother. We are continuing our study of the books of history. These 12 books give us the history of Israel from the time of the conquest up until the time the Jews returned from the Babylonian captivity and rebuilt the wall around Jerusalem. In our journey through these books, we have come to the books of First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, and there are a number of subjects in those four books that we are examining. We began with the reign of King Solomon, and then the foolish reign of his son Rehoboam, who lost the ten northern tribes. Then we examined Jeroboam, who introduced golden calf worship to the northern kingdom. And then, as bad as that was, it got worse with the dark days of King Ahab and his wife Jezebel. Into that dark era, God raised up two remarkable prophets, Elijah and Elisha, and we examined the life of both of these extraordinary men. The uh, divided kingdom, the kingdom that, uh, the divided kingdom uh, that uh, we discussed took, uh, took place in 9, 931 B.C. when Solomon died. The northern kingdom lasted about 200 years. It had 19 kings, all of them wicked. And after 200 years, God raised up the, uh, the Assyrians, and they put a, an end to the northern kingdom. We discussed that last week. They conquered the northern kingdom. They deported about 50,000 men, women, and children. They, re they then brought back Gentiles to live in the northern kingdom. The Gentiles intermarried with the Jews. So in time, the, Jew the Jews in the northern kingdom lost their distinctive Jewish identity. And uh, <coughs> in time, they not only lost that, but they rejected Orthodox Judaism. And uh, what we have is a group of people called Samaritans. Uh, the Samaritans were racially mixed, Gentile and Jew, and they had a heretical form of Judaism, which uh, we discussed as well. They built their own temple on Mount Gerizim, and, we, uh, and they still exist. There are about 1,800 of them worldwide. The southern kingdom lasted a little longer. It lasted about 350 years. Uh, and part of the reason was because they had a handful of good kings. The 19 kings in the north were all bad. In the 19 kings in the south, uh, 11 were wicked. Uh, six were reasonably good. That is, they, as individuals, worshipped Jehovah, but they didn't use their authority as kings to impose um, righteousness on the kingdom. There were two exceptions to that, however. Two kings we view as excellent, King Hezekiah and King Josiah. We, we examined Hezekiah last week. This evening we'll pick up with the examination of Josiah and then, Lord willing, the Babylonian captivity. What made these two me kings excellent was because they not only lived righteous lives and worshipped Jehovah and not any of the false gods, but they imposed Jehovah worship on Israel. What they did was this. They sent out the troops to tear down the idols. Israel's a theocracy. It wasn't a democracy. The king is God, and his surrogate on earth was the king he placed in the, on the throne of David. Um, and so the kings had a responsibility to impose Jehovah worship and tear down and purge the land of its idols. These are the only two kings that actually did that. Both Hezekiah and Josiah were personally righteous. They worshiped Jehovah, and they sent out the troops to uh, force Jehovah worship on the land, they tore down the idols. We talked about that last week with about Hezekiah. Let's talk about Josiah. Josiah was Israel's, the southern kingdom's last good king. Josiah was the great-grandson of Hezekiah. He ascended the throne 45 years after the death of his grandfather, Hezekiah. He ruled for 31 years, and they were good years. The years Israel had great kings were good years for Israel. The years Israel had great kings, kings that not only worshipped God but demanded that the nation follow suit, were good years. They prospered under King David. They prospered under King David. Uh, they prospered under Josiah and Hezekiah. And there's a lesson to be learned. God nations that honor him. So he was the last good king. He died four years later. The Babylonians conquered Israel. We'll talk more about that shortly. The years between Hezekiah and Josiah were not good years. Hezekiah died, and he was followed by his son Manasseh, and then Manasseh's son Ammon. Ammon only lived about uh, two years. Manasseh lived 40 years. And 
Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, was so wicked, he offered up his children as sacrifices to the, to the god Moloch in the Valley of Hinnon. Now, several months ago, uh, we discussed the god Moloch, that horrible pagan god. It was a giant statue made of metal, remember? They built fires underneath it. Its hands were out like this. And after the thing, the, this whole metal Moloch god got scalding hot, they would place their life babies in the hands. That's wicked. And we're doing the same thing with abortion, absolutely the same thing. At least they had an excuse. They wanted Moloch to, to, to give them rain and prosper their crops. We're doing it for convenience sake. We're worse. I know that's a harsh statement, but it's what the truth is, folks. And if you think God uh, takes things kindly to those who are murdering babies, I go back and read about Moloch. God despised it, and rightly so. Should he not? But Manasseh was guilty of that. And he was actually taken into captivity by the Babylonians, the good news is, and he repented. So for those of you who have children who've gone astray, wickedly astray, and we all know about this, Christendom is filled with families who have raised their children in a godly manner only to see some of their kids go off and live really wicked lives, not just normal lives, normally wicked <laughs> lives, but extremely wicked. There's a difference. Not all sin is equal. And I know what it's like to have family members live wicked lives. Well, Manasseh should encourage you a little. He was incredibly wicked. He went into, was captured by the Babylonians, put in prison. He repented, and God restored him. I think we'll see Manasseh in heaven. But yeah, he was extremely wicked. Uh, his son Ammon went, was ascended to the throne. He was so bad, uh, he was assassinated. <laughs> his own troops did him in. And then Hezekiah, I mean, with Josiah, his son, ascended the throne. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Josiah now. He ascended to the throne at age eight. His godliness was due in part to he had godly advisors. And one of his advisors was the prophet Zephaniah. That's the Zephaniah after which a book in the Bible is named. If we go to our chart on prophets, and we'll be getting to the books of prophecy next fall, Lord willing, there were 16 prophets. Ten of them lived prior to the Babylonian captivity. And I've sort of lined them up on this chart. You have this in your notes. And, and uh, sort of approximate when they lived and ministered. And Zephaniah, as you can see, prophesied toward the end of the existence of the southern kingdom. And this prophet Zephaniah was the personal tutor, tutor to young Josiah. His father was useless. His grandfather was really useless. His great-grandfather was good. <laughs> Hezekiah, but then Manasseh and Ammon were not so good, but God intervened and gave him a tutor called Zephaniah. Now, having Zephaniah as a tutor is not bad, and he was his counselor because he came to the throne when he was eight years old. At age eight, he became king. We read about it in 2 Chronicles 34. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. Now, there are only two kings that are compared favorably to King David, Hezekiah and Josiah. David is a standard against which God measures all of them. How did you measure up against David? Well, not so good. <laughs> but two did, Hezekiah and Josiah. The rest of them did not. At age 8, he became king. At age 16, he began to seek after the Lord, the, excuse me, to seek after the God of David, his father. We read about it in 2 Chronicles 34. In the eighth year of his reign, the eighth year of his reign would be when he was 16 years old because he came to the throne when he was 8. Okay? While he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father, David. Point here. Don't despise young people. There's a thing, really... <laughs> I know I've, I'm going to repeat it again. Don't despise young people. I know bald-headed old men like myself, we tend to think that wisdom comes with age. Well, I've met some of my contemporaries, and they ain't wise. <laughs> and sometimes I demonstrate how little wisdom I have. 
God does not despise young people. And the truth of the matter is, it's true as you grow older, you should get wiser and learn more. And I understand that. And I don't despise the wisdom of young pe- old folks, uh, so I'm not putting down the old folks. And hopefully as we all grow older, we get a little wiser and learn to live more godly lives. But sometimes we get so wrapped up in the growth and wisdom with age that we despise young people. Let me tell you what. Uh, there are an awful lot of very young people who did extraordinary work. Read the stories about missionaries who've gone off to do great things to the Lord around the world. Many of them were young when they went. Uh, uh, Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers in the 1800s, one of the greatest preachers since the Reformation, really started cooking when he was 18 years old. By the time he was 30, he had one of the largest churches in London. Now, I sometimes look at that and think, I wonder if he, if he was part of our age and our era. We wouldn't allow that. He's 18, he's too young. Well, God didn't seem to think so. God didn't think so at all. And in terms of ability to accomplish things, in the world of science, one scientist once said, if you haven't, won your no- if you haven't done the work necessary for your Nobel, Pro- Nobel Prize by the time you're 35, you'll never get it. The work isn't going to happen. W- young people accomplish great things. Alexander the Great conquered the world by the time he was 33. Now, I'm not suggesting we go out and imitate him, but (laughs) the point being, uh, he looked to God while still a young man, and it served him well. At age 8, Josiah became king. At age 16, he began to seek after the God of David, his father. At age 20, he cleansed, cleansed Jerusalem and Judah of idolatrous objects. Not only were idols out scattered around the country, they were even in Jerusalem itself. Let's read about it in Chronicles 34. In his 12th year, the 12th year would be the 20th year of his reign, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of, hi- of high places, Asherah poles, carved idols, and cast images. Now when you read the expression Asherah poles, let me explain what that was referring to. It's referring to the female consort of Baal. Baal has that skinny little idol. We've, I've thrown up some pictures some, time, some months ago of the, the, the idol, the images of Baal. And they would have altars before that image, and they would offer up sacrifices to Baal. And then next to it, they'd have a pole. And the pole was called the Astra pole, and it symbolized Baal's female consort. Now, I've used that female consort because... Sometimes they viewed her as his mother, sometimes as his wife, sometimes as his girlfriend. So when you make up your own religion, your own gods, you can make it up any way you want. So one town wants her to be his mother, another town wants her to be the girlfriend, another one the wife. You understand the idea. But the, when we talk about astropoles, we're talking about the female consort to Baal. So you can be sure if there was an astropole there, there was an idol to Baal. Okay. These he broke to pieces and scattered over the graves of those who he had, who had sacrificed to them. In other words, he didn't just knock down the, the altars to Baal and cut down the Asherah poles. He took the prophets, who were the prophets to Baal and Asherah, and killed them and burned their bones on the altar. And what does God think of this man? God liked this man a lot. These he broke in pieces and scattered over the graves of those he had scattered, who had sacrificed to them. He burned the bones of the priests on their altars, and so he purged Judah and Jerusalem. In the towns of Manasseh, he even went north. He was so zealous for God, he tore down idols in the north. Now you say, well, wait a minute, but the north was uh, not his country. True, but they were Jews, and they should have. They haven't really fallen into Samaritanism yet. And uh, Assyria, you say, but Syria was controlling the northern kingdom. It was, but at this point in time, Assyria is starting to decline in power. Babylon is rising in power, and in that vacuum, the north was fairly weak. So he took that opportunity to not only tear down idols in the southern kingdom, he tore down the idols in the northern kingdom. Now here's a man who's zealous for God. In the towns of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Simeon, as far as Naphtali, and then the ruins around them, he tore down the altars and the Asherah poles and crushed the idols to power and cut to pieces all the incense altars throughout Israel. Then he went back to Jerusalem. So at age 8, he became king. At age 16, he began to seek after the God of David, his father. At age 20, Josiah cleansed Jerusalem and Judah of idolatrous objects and went north. 
at age 26, he began repairs on the temple that had fallen into disrepair. And while the construction workers were working on the temple, they discovered something. The Bible! That's how, how bankrupt this nation was. Notice they discovered the book of Moses, the Pentateuch. We read about it in 2 Chronicles 34. While they were bringing out the money that had been taken into the temple of the Lord, Hilkiah, the priest, found the book of the law of the Lord that had been given through Moses. Hilkiah said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of law in the temple of the Lord. He gave it to Shaphan. Then Shaphan took the book to the king and reported to him, Your officials are doing everything that has been committed to them. They have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and have entrusted it to the supervisors and workers. Then Shaphan, the secretary, informed the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. Wow, he didn't know about this book. And Shaphan read, it, read from it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. That means he was in great distress. And he said, Great is the Lord's anger that is poured out on us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written in this book. They discovered, they had so dismissed the worship of Jehovah and his commands that they didn't know about this book. When it was read to good King Josiah, he realized they'd messed up big time. So, age 8, becomes king. 16, seeks after the Lord. 20, cleanses the temple, uh, clean, cleanses Jerusalem and Judah of idolatrous objects as well as the north. At age 26, he begins repairs on the temple that had fallen into repair and disrepair. And at age 27, Josiah led Israel in one of its greatest re revivals. They renewed this, and they even renewed the celebration of Passover that had been forgotten. You notice how bankrupt they are at this point? Chronicles 34, then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord with the men of Judah, the people of Jerusalem, the priests and the Levites, all the people from the least to the greatest. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the temple of the Lord. The king stood by his pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commands, regulations, and decrees with all his heart and all his soul and to obey the words of the covenant written in this book. Then he had everyone in Jerusalem and Benjamin pledge themselves to it. The people of Jerusalem did this in accordance with the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. Josiah removed all the detestable idols from all the territory belonging to the Israelites and he had all who were present in Israel serve the Lord their God. As long as he lived, they did not fail to follow the Lord, the God of their fathers. So this is a brief summary of the life of good King Josiah. He not only personally was personally devoted to the worship of Jehovah, he acted on that by going out and destroying the idols and insisting. As king, he had the authority to do so. He was God's servant on earth, and he insisted that they obey the commands that God had given. And those were good years for Israel. Uh, Woods wrote, the three decades of Josiah's reign were among the happiest in Judah's experience. They, had they were characterized by peace, prosperity, and reform. No outside enemies made war. The people could concentrate on constructive activity. And Josiah himself sought to please God by reinstituting matters commanded in the Mosaic law. Good years. Good king. He enforced righteousness and God blessed. These are the main events that we have examined in our study of First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. There's one sad event that we must still examine, and that was the Babylonian captivity. As we pointed out earlier, when the with the death of Solomon, the king was divided into two. The kingdom of Israel was divided into two kingdoms: the northern kingdom and southern kingdom. Northern kingdom lasted 200 years, and it ended with the Assyrian captivity. The southern kingdom, because of a few righteous kings imposing a level of righteousness on the southern kingdom, lasted 350 years. 
uh, but they were still wicked. With the death of Josiah, uh, they f- the, it, the nation went right back to its idolatry, and that's the number one sin. The, the number one sin was idolatry. And because of that, God brought the Babylonians against them, and the Babylonians conquered them. Let me give you... Uh, now, the, let me just give you a little sense of the Babylonians. We date the Assyrian captivity as 722. We date the Babylonian captivity as 586. And what happened in 586 was that the, Israel, with the Babylonians came down, destroyed Jerusalem. They tore down the wall, they destroyed the temple, and they took essentially the entire population back to Babylon as captives. When the Assyrians captured the northern kingdom, uh, all they did was carry about 50,000 back into captivity, and as we pointed out on several occasions, they sent thousands of Gentiles to intermarry with the Jews in the northern kingdom, and they became Samaritans. The southern kingdom, was things were a little bit different. They sent, took back to Babylon essentially the entire population. They left a few behind, but mostly there were men who were blind, women who were blind, or lame, or had leprosy, or malcontents. They didn't want to increase their welfare rolls. They had enough of that. All they wanted were the able bodied The people who couldn't take care of themselves, they left them in the southern kingdom. They took the able-bodied men, women, and children. But even though we dated at 586, that wasn't the first installment of the Babylonian captivity. Actually, there were three campaigns and the, uh, of the, three, the, the Babylonians executed three campaigns against the southern kingdom. The first was in 605, which was four years after Josiah died. They came down, they conquered the southern kingdom, and then Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king at the time, told the Jews, look, you've been conquered. You're now a vassal state of mind. He had an empire. When they conquered the uh, Assyrians, they took over the Assyrian Empire, which was filled with a lot of other nations. The Middle East was filled with nations. Now, most of these uh, conquering armies and, and conquering nations didn't want everybody destroyed, but they wanted everybody to be working and paying taxes, because that's one of the primary functions of government, to get taxes. Why build an empire if you can't get money out of those people? And so when, uh, when Nebuchadnezzar conquered the southern kingdom, he just conquered them. They lost the war. They were, they were dead in the water, as it were. But he said they did, he, they, he didn't tear down their walls. He didn't destroy their temple. He left a phony sort of puppet government in place and left most of the people there. And the idea being that, that uh, Babylon was still the authority over them and the government rule is a puppet government of his own, um, but uh, he wanted them to keep working and functioning. He didn't want them all coming back to Babylon. Uh, but he did take a few back. And what he did was he, in that first, the first campaign against the southern kingdom in 605, he conquered them, and he took Daniel back to Babylon in, bab- in captivity. Daniel we all know about. And his buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the fire guys. So they were part of a small number of Israelites he took back to Babylon in that first captivity. Now he's got a puppet government in place. The people are working hard, paying taxes to him. Now something interesting took place at this time. We'll be examining this a little bit more closely when we get to the books of prophecy. There was a prophet who was alive and well and prophesying at this time, the time of the Babylonian captivity. He, he was prophesying prior to 605, prior to the Babylonians coming down and, first and conquering Israel the first time. And he remained a prophet throughout this whole era. His name was Jeremiah. Now prior to 605, prior to the Babylonians coming down and conquering Judah for the first time, Jeremiah spent years pleading with the people to repent, get their act together. Throw away their idols, live righteous lives, be godly. And he kept warning them, if you don't do these things, God's going to punish you with the Babylonians because they were the rising power at the time. And there were false prophets around that said, God would never do that. Don't listen to that, that fundamentalist, Jeremiah. 
God is too loving. Really? They would, and we're his special people. They wouldn't, God would never do a thing like that. God thinks we're nice. God didn't think they were nice. So that was Jeremiah's message, and the people hated him for it. One time they dropped him down in a well. You remember the story. We'll get to more. Well, people didn't listen. They listened to the false prophets. It's just, it's just people listening to false prophets today. God's too loving to send anyone to the lake of fire. God is too loving to bring about the great tribulation. God is too loving, too loving. They know more about God than God knows about God. So anyway, that was the message prior to the first conquering in 605. Now, w as soon as they were conquered by the Babylonians and the Babylonians set up their puppet government, Jeremiah's message changed. His message, his message now was the Babylonians are God's instrument of judgment against you for your sinful behavior. Don't rebel against them. If you rebel against the Babylonians, you're rebelling against God because God raised up the Babylonians to punish you for your sinful behavior. So obey them. If you do, you will live in peace. You'll have to pay taxes. That's a pain. Nobody likes to pay taxes. But you'll live in peace. You won't be destroyed. You won't be taken away into captivity. Well, the people didn't listen to him prior to 605. Do you think they would listen to him now? Nah. They kept rebelling. And so what happened was Nebuchadnezzar says, you stiff-necked Jews, I, got, I, can't, I can't deal with this. So he came down again in 597. He came down uh, eight years later and reconquered them because they had been rebelling. And I'm sure they weren't paying the taxes they were supposed to pay, and you know how that deal goes. This time, he took a few more back into captivity. He still didn't tear down the wall, destroy the temple. He left a, pu a puppet government in place. And uh, at this occasion, he took Ezekiel. Remember the great prophet Ezekiel, who we'll get to next fall, Lord willing? This is when Ezekiel was taken away into captivity. First captivity, 605, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Second one, Ezekiel. Now, you would think the people would start listening to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, you were right before 605 when you warned that the Babylonians would come down and conquer us if we didn't repent. We were wrong when we rejected your message and listened to the false prophets. Uh, so now we're going to, and, and you were correct when you said if we keep rebelling, he's going to come again and, and, and conquer us again. Uh, so now we're going to start listening to you. No, <laughs> they didn't. He said, repeat, he says, folks, stop it, stop it, stop it. He's going to come again. Because after they came in, in 597, after the Babylonians came down in 597 and reconquered them, uh, he kept pleading with them, stop rebelling. They continued to rebel. So in 586, the Babylonians came down and under Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians said, we've had it with you folks. We're not going to leave you here to rebel. Those blind people can rebel all they want. The lame can rebel. The cripples can rebel. The malcontents can rebel. But all you able-bodied men, women, and children coming back to us, to Babylon with us. When they came down in 586, and this is when we date the Babylonian captivity, the Babylonians knocked down the wall. They burned Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple. They took everything that was in the temple back to Babylon with them, those things, the, the, all the utensils of gold and silver, they will rise up again in our stories. And then they took essentially the entire population back to Babylon as captive. At this point, actually Nebuchadnezzar knew about the work Jeremiah was doing in trying to straighten these people out. He offered Jeremiah a good position in Babylon if he wanted to come. Jeremiah, this great godly prophet, who nobody listened to. One of those frustrating ministries that you will have ever read about. He said, no, I will stay with these malcontents. And his new message was, he couldn't say anything more about stop rebelling, there's not anybody much left to rebel, and there was nothing left to protect against the Babylonians. His new message was, stay in the land. I know everything has essentially been destroyed, most everybody's gone, but God will... It will, will enable us to earn a living from the, the fields and from our herds, and we can live in peace. Do you think they listen to him now? Nah. They said, we're going to Egypt. We're going to go escape to Egypt. He said, don't do that. But they did. And they took him with them 
and the, and, and, and the legend is that uh, he was, they put him in a log when he was down there and sawed him in half log. There's a thankless, he had a thankless job, but he was faithful. And if you read through the scriptures, he's esteemed very highly. Now, one the number of points we can make about this, but one overarching point is this. God may have given you a ministry like Billy Graham, which you can reach millions, and God, I'm thrilled that Billy Graham did. He may give you a ministry in which you have very poor results that are, uh, from a natural point of view. In fact, we only know of one convert, Jeremiah's his servant. Otherwise, there's nothing favorable to report. But God esteemed him highly because he did what God wanted him to do. And one of his jobs was to be light in the middle of darkness, was to be truth in the middle of lies. There were false prophets. We have false prophets in our world today, not only from false religions, but false prophets within Christendom. And this is right in Judaism. These people are saying, in the name of Jehovah, these false prophets, everything Jeremiah tells you is a lie. Well, Jer what Jeremiah told them was the truth, and what the false prophets were saying were lies. He had a thankless ministry. Now, sometimes God has called us to thankless ministries. I, I've often thought about the, the stories of those first missionaries to South Korea. They got no converts for almost forever. I mean, they went on and on and on for years. They, had very, they just couldn't find the fruit. It wasn't because they weren't working hard. It wasn't because they weren't praying. It wasn't because they weren't godly. It wasn't because they didn't have a good strategy. They just worked and worked and worked at it. A little bit took place, and then the next generation a little bit more. And right now, it's the most Christian nation in the Far East. Sometimes it takes a while. So Jeremiah had sort of a thankless, thankless ministry. So with the Babylonian captivity, let's look at it uh, in a little bit more detail, and then we will close the evening. In seven, I'm going to try to give you a sense of all the action on a map. In 722 B.C., the Assyrians, the capital city of Nineveh, came down and conquered Samaria, the capital city of the northern kingdom. In 701, remember, uh, under Sennacherib, they tried to do the same thing in the southern kingdom, but there was a man named Hezekiah who was the king, along with the prophet Isaiah, pleaded with God, and God put a stop to that and killed 185,000 Assyrians. Everybody went back home, and Sennacherib's sons killed him. In 612, the Babylonians, now remember, the Assyrians had been the, the major Gentile power for 900 years, for, excuse me, for 300 years, from 900 B.C. to 612 B.C. And, uh, but in 612 B.C., the Babylonians, about 100 years after they, the Assyrians had conquered the northern kingdom, the Babylonians conquered Nineveh, and they became the major Gentile power in the Middle East. In 586, the Babylonians conquered the southern kingdom, and that's sort of where we are right now. There are three campaigns, as I pointed out, in the Babylonian captivity. Uh, the Babylonians conquered the uh, Israelites, the southern kingdom, the first time in 605. That's when they took away Daniel. They conquered uh, the southern kingdom the second time in 597. That's when they took away Ezekiel. And they conquered uh, the southern kingdom a third time in 586. That's when they destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, and they deported the entire population. Israel remained in captivity for 70 years. They were set free when Cyrus, king of Persia, conquered Babylon. So uh, the, the Syrians for 300 years were the major power, but when they were conquered by the Babylonians, the Babylonians became the big major power. And uh, they, as we know, took the uh, entire population of Israel back to Babylon in captivity. God only wanted to be in captivity for 70 years, so God raised up the Syrians to conquer the Babylonians, and the Syrians let them go. It's very hard when you've worked that hard in a nation and capturing all those good citizens and made them make a place to let them go. It's sort of like the Civil War, isn't it? The Southerners didn't really want to give up their slaves. There had to be a war. Well, that, in a sense, that's it. This, they, now, they didn't make slaves of everybody, but they had captives, and they wanted to keep them. They didn't want them to go, so God says, that's not a problem, Babylon. I'll just raise up another nation, the, the Persians. They will come in. They will conquer you. And the Persians, God gave the Persians a heart for the Israelites, and the Persians let them go back home. So they only stayed in captivity 70 years. 
So that's what you have with this third map in 539. The, so we have the Assyrians, 722, conquer the northern kingdom. In 612, the Babylonians conquer the Assyrians, and they then go and conquer the southern kingdom. In 539, the Persians conquered the Babylonians, and they let the Israelites go home. Now, well, let me see. They, okay, first conquering, 605, second one, 597, third one, 586. Israel remained in captivity 70 years. They were set free by Cyrus, king of Persia. They ceased to exist. From this point on, they ceased to exist as a sovereign nation. It's true that when the, when the, when the Persians conquered and so let the Israelites return, uh, they were allowed to go home. But only about 50,000 returned. Most of them remained in, in Mesopotamia. And they became part of that nation we call the Diaspora. Uh, but even though they returned home, they had to live under the authority of the Persians. The Persians had an empire that covered all the, all the way down to Egypt, and the Persians' empire covered what is modern-day Turkey, pieces of Europe, and as far uh, uh, east as, um, as, as India. So it was a big empire, and they allowed local governments to exist. They wanted local governments to run the countries, but they did so under the authority of the Persians. We'll be talking th more about that as we work our way through the remaining books in, in the, uh, of, of, of history. But, and then the Persians rule until the Greeks under Alexander the Great conquered the Persians. So guess who took over Israel then? The Greeks. And the Greeks ruled uh, Israel until the Romans conquered the Greeks. And then the Romans ruled Israel. And until A.D. 70, when the Roman general Titus destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and dispersed the Jews throughout the world. And they did not become a sovereign nation again until 1948. So from the time of the Babylonian ca captivity onward, Israel ceased to be a sovereign nation. At times it had a little more, a little t taste of independence, but most of the time they did not. So they were ruled by the Babylonians, then the Persians, then the Greeks, and then the Romans. And today, they're a sovereign nation, 1948. But there are lots of folks who want to destroy them still. All right. We now have finished our pre-exilic books. The books of history, as we pointed out, 12 books that give us the history of Israel from the time of the conquest of, of Canaan up until the time the Jews rebuilt the wall around Jerusalem. The 12 books. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles gives us the history from the time of the conquest up into the time of the Babylonian captivity. Israel now is going to spend 70 years in captivity. And with Cyrus, they conquering the Babylonians, they were set free. We have three books of history remaining. The books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. These are three post-exilic books. And we talk about, you'll hear... Uh, Bible teachers throw around the terms pre-exilic and post-exilic. They're talking about the time before the Babylonian exile or the time after the Babylonian exile. So we finished our study of the pre-exilic books of history. Now we have three books remaining in the books of history that are post-exilic. The books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. We're going to begin, I'll just give you a brief overview of the book of Ezra, and then we'll pick up next week and study it more in detail. The book of Ezra talks about the return of the Jews from the Babylonian captivity. Remember, Cyrus conquers the Babylonians, and he lets the children of Israel return home. Only about 50,000 do. Most had built homes in Mesopotamia, had built businesses. They didn't want to, the hardship of returning to Israel. Sad. Uh, so Ezra tells us about the return and their struggles to rebuild the temple and then about a revival that took place uh, 60 years after they rebuilt the temple or 80 years after they first returned. Chapters 1 through 6 tell us about uh, Israel's return from captivity and the struggle to rebuild the temple. Chapters 7 through 10 tell us about a revival that took place 80 years after they returned. When they returned in 538 uh, B.C., they 
laid a found, they built an altar. First they built a brazen altar in Jerusalem. And they started offering up sacrifices because the ones who returned were, for the most part, the religious Jews. The not-so-religious people weren't interested in going back to Israel and rebuilding the nation and, and worshiping God in the temple. So the, 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 the least religious tended to stay in Mesopotamia. The religious zealots returned with priests and so forth under a man named uh, Zerubbabel. And uh, at any rate, they returned. They built the altar, brazen altar, and started offering sacrifices to God. They even celebrated the Feast of Trumpets. And then they laid the foundation for the temple, and they celebrated that with, uh, with, with trumpets and, and songs and dancing, and then they just stopped. They stopped for two reasons. One, the surrounding Gentile nations hired bullies to come in and intimidate the construction workers. That was a little bit scary. And the reason the surrounding Gentiles living in that area did that was because they were afraid that if the Jews rebuilt their temple, God, the God of Israel, Jehovah, would come down and live in the temple and bless the Jews. And when he blessed the Jews, he might bless the Jews at their expense, the Gentiles' expense. So the surrounding Gentile people, including, incidentally, the Samaritans now, the northern kingdom, they, they don't think of themselves as, as the Jews anymore. They don't like the Jews. Uh, so all these surrounding Gentiles say, we don't want this temple going up. They're saying, well, that's ridiculous. If they... They have their own gods. Why, why are they worried about Jehovah? Keep in mind, these are polytheistic people. This will make no sense unless you realize that. They had their own god. Asherah, Baal, a whole tons of different gods. But they also believe Jehovah existed. They don't think of him the way we think of him as the all-powerful, all-knowing God. They thought of him as a very powerful God of the Jews. After all, Jehovah had made Israel prosper, had it not? Under King David and Solomon, Israel became the dominant power in that part of the world. And they knew that from their own history. So when the Jews came back and started building the temple, the surrounding Gentiles started looking at this deal and saying, we don't need, we don't need this. We don't need Jehovah coming down and dwelling in that temple and blessing the Jews at our expense. So they hired bullies to intimidate them. So that was one of the reasons they stopped building the temple. The second reason was because they got sort of wrapped up in building their own homes. <laughs> that was the sad part. They said, you know, people said, well, we've been bullied here. That's a good excuse to go work on our own home, which they did. And so for the next 15 years, they didn't do anything. And then God raised up two more prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, the last, second, the, 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 the second to last, the third to last books in the Old Testament. Haggai and Zechariah came down and started pushing the people to build the temple. And, interestingly enough, uh, a Persian king, Artaxerxes, looked at, uh, uh, supported them and sent money to help. The Jews were getting more help from the Persian king than they were getting from their own people. That's another story. We'll talk about that later. So at any event, they finally got the temple built in 516, which was exactly 70 years after it had been destroyed. Remember it was destroyed in 586 B.C., right? In 605, 597, the Babylonians conquered the southern kingdom, but they didn't destroy the temple. They destroyed the temple in 586, and it was rebuilt in 516, and this is sort of probably how we measure the 70 years they were in captivity. Remember? And next week, I'm going to go through the prophecies. Not only did God tell the Israelites through their prophets, in particular Jeremiah, that they would be in captivity for 70 years. Through the prophet Isaiah, writing six, 200 years before that, Isaiah prophesied that a man named Je Cyrus would let them back, would conquer the Babylonians and let them return home. So uh, they built the temple after six years of, uh, excuse me, after doing nothing for 15 years. They finally built it. It was finished in 516 B.C., and we read about that in chapters 1 through 6. There's a pause. We don't read anything in Ezra for the next 60 years, and it picks up in 457 uh, in chapter 7 through 10 with Ezra in the 
city at, at back in Mesopotamia talking to the Persian king about the spiritual bankruptcy of the Israelites in Jerusalem. And the Persian king gives him money and men to return to rebuild, uh, to, to, to institute a revival among the Jewish people. So this is the book of Ezra. The first six chapters talk about the rebuilding, uh, the Jews returning, starting to rebuild the temple, delaying it for 15 years, and then under Zechariah, starting up the building, it took them four years, and they finally finishes it in 516. Ezra also said, tells us about what happened 60 years after that when the prophet Ezra comes to Jerusalem and, and starts a great revival and also cleans up a lot of wickedness that was taking place, which is kind of unpleasant. And we'll get with Ezra next week. And uh, then after him, Nehemiah, who was raised up by God to help the children of Israel rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. And the third post-exilic book is the book of Esther, Esther, which about some of the men and women who remained in dias the diaspora, who remained in Mesopotamia. So there are three post-exilic books, the book of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Ezra tells us about the Jews returning, the rebuilding of the wall, and the revival that took place 60 years after they, excuse me, the, the rebuilding of the temple, and then the revival that took place uh, 60 years after they finished the temple. Nehemiah tells us the story of the Jews rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem, and Esther tells us about the Jews who remained in Mesopotamia, remember part of the diaspora, and the tough life they had, and how some folks wanted to kill them and wipe out every Jew on the planet. Okay? We'll pick up next week. Father, we love you. We worship you again. We thank you so much for your many blessings to us. We thank you for the great men and women who preceded us. I think of Hezekiah and Josiah and Jeremiah and Daniel and Ezekiel, all of these extraordinary men and women who lived in antiquity and gave their all for you. I pray, Lord, that we'll use this as a model that we can follow. In Jesus' name we pray.